you will notice that uh, in, in place of preaching today on the triumphant entry, uh, we're, we've been going through the book of Mark. And so we're just continuing on uh, in, the next, in, in the next section. So we're in Mark, the seventh chapter today, verses 24 through 37. If that disappoints you because you really wanted to uh, focus upon Christ's triumphant entry, uh, you can check out Matthew 21 and read it there, or Mark 11 and read it there, or John 19 and read it there. I mean Luke 19 and then John 12. Luke 19 and John 12. But today I have the privilege of sharing with you the story of two desperate women. I, I should say two people who desperately needed help. One was a female, one a male. And um, one a desperate woman and her even more desperate little girl. And the other a helpless, hard of hearing, and difficult to understand man. And so both were brought to Jesus by friends or by relatives who urgently wanted to free them of their life-limiting impediments. There are, there are some truths behind these, amari- these amazing stories, I believe, that magnify and highlight the gripping power of prayer. So let's begin by simply reading these two stories, Mark 7, uh, and we're going to pick it up with verse 24 and read them. It says, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Interesting. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syria, Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go, the demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus, now imagine this, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven with a deep sigh and said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Two people, two great stories that apply to us today. And so I want to share out of these two stories, stories that assure us that by our compound and united prayers together, We can make a real difference in the world. There are stories that empower every Christian and encourage each of us to pray in unity. So here are some truths from these stories that I hope that you take with you today and put them into practice. But before we do that, let's just stop for a moment to pray. Father God, I know that the words that I speak without the power of your Holy Spirit will simply just leave my mouth and fall flat. I ask, Father, for the, your spirit to open each ear today to drive what I have to say and to share from your word. And Lord, may you motivate us deep within our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing I want to point out here today is that both stories begin with some, someone other than the person that was in need that approached Jesus. Both stories begin with someone other than the person in need approaching Jesus. In the first story, uh, here in Mark, the seventh chapter, it's the mom. But before we discuss her and her needy daughter, uh, let's get back to the, let's kind of get the back story here that begins in verse 24, when it says, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. 
And so if you have maps in the back of your Bible and you check it out, the map that shows Israel or Palestine during the time of Christ, uh, and you check the mileage, you will notice that the ancient city of Tyre is on the Mediterranean Sea to the north, and it is uh, 40 miles from the southern end of the Sea of Galilee. And so the, those of you that went uh, and did the walk for the pregnancy clinic a week ago yesterday, that was a little over a two-mile walk, so you'd still have another 38 miles to go if you were walking that distance. So it was a, a, a pretty good walk that uh, was taking place there. Tyre still exists today. It's the fourth largest city that's in Lebanon. And it was Gentile territory, and therefore most Jews, and let's say were businessmen, would not go there. It was, it was certainly a, a pagan city. It appears that Jesus went there for a little bit of rest, but I think he had a greater purpose because it wouldn't be too much longer until he would be commissioning the apostles with these words of the Great Commission. When he said in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, go and make disciples of whom? All nations. Uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, there might be a second reason for Jesus getting out of his area. He had become so popular that every place that he went, uh, people were coming to him, not seeking religious instruction, but seeking healing. Uh, they wanted healing. And so the, the fact was that wasn't the primary reason that Jesus came was just to heal people uh, physically, but he came to bring spiritual healing to everyone. And so just like we get exhausted and need some downtime, so did Jesus. And so Mark records Jesus in verse 31, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and didn't want anyone to know it. You've been there, haven't you? You've wanted to get away? Just as exhausted and particularly in those working years, you're exhausted, you're tired, you don't want to see anybody, you don't want to talk, you just want to get away for a little while. And you might love other people with all your heart, but working with people can get wearing and grinding, believe it or not. And certainly that was the case with Jesus. And even every place he went, he was recognized. And so most were for him, but some were against him and even wanted to kill him. And so it was that he left town and he went north and he slipped into this house in Tyre. I believe he just wanted a little downtime, but it was not to be. Notice what Mark records next. Picking it up in verse 24, Jesus left that place, went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and didn't want anyone to know it, yet it did not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman with a little daughter possessed by an evil spirit came and fell at his feet. I feel for Jesus here. Bone weary after a 40 mile walk, exhausted from morning to night by requests for healing, praying many times through the night, beat up by the constant harangues of the Pharisees and their cronies, and knowing that he was drawing ever closer to the cross. And so uh, he needed, uh, I mean, we can appreciate his need for some physical uh, and uh, emotional downtime, but it wasn't to happen. Now, let me call your attention to the fact that the person asking for the miracle was not asking for herself. She came seeking a miracle on behalf of another. And we're going to pick this story back up here in a moment. But first, let's, let's flash to the second story. When Jesus left, he, he left Tyre and he did this big loop. He went up to Sidon, and, uh, which was 20, it's 25 miles below Beirut. And today it's called Seda. And it's the third largest city in modern Lebanon. It, it doesn't say that Jesus did any miracles there. It doesn't say how long he stayed there. But perhaps he just couldn't get rest here uh, in Syria, and he, he went farther north uh, up there to Sidon. And uh, so uh, then he uh, goes back 
from there to what is known as the Decapolis, which were ten cities, little cities, in the, uh, Gal- in the area of Galilee. And so it was, in, it was there in uh, Tyre that one of the miracles happened, and the other one was back down in the Decapolis uh, where, by Galilee, where it happened. And that's where the man that was deaf and mute uh, was brought to Jesus by his friends. So let me repeat this point. Both stories begin with someone other than the person in need approaching Jesus. In other words, they had other people coming to Christ on their behalf. So I want to ask you this morning, is there someone that you need to bring to Christ? Is there somebody that you know that really has needs and do you lift them up to Jesus? Do you try to bring them to Jesus and share Christ with them? Do you pray for them? I'm sure you know someone that really needs the Lord's help and really needs his healing power. Well, Mark already mentioned it earlier today, but at 9 o'clock on Tuesday mornings, we have a meeting right out here, and, and some people come, and we pray together. And I encourage you also to put that person's name on one of the, on the uh, uh, insert in your bulletin and drop it in the basket, the wicker basket, before you go out, and let us pray for them. But better yet, come down at 9 o'clock, on Tuesday mornings and pray with us and lift that person up. And so uh, perhaps the Holy Spirit's putting on your heart to intercede on behalf of a friend. And so uh, that's, that's uh, the point that I wanted to make right here. Uh, but let's go on to point number two, and that's the people who approached Jesus were bold beyond measure, bold to the point of being unashamed to beg. Look at the mother of the demon-possessed child. As we read in verse 26, the woman was a Greek, born in Syria, Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Now the fame of Jesus has spread far beyond Israel. And this dear mother had undoubtedly heard of this very man that had set the captives free. But he was miles away. Two miracles don't remain hidden. I mean, they travel, and they travel out of the country, and people hear about it. And she'd probably heard about Jesus raising a 12-year-old girl back to life again. She had probably heard uh, about the demon-possessed man that ran naked and howling through the cemeteries uh, uh, in the, uh, out there in the area of the Decapolis, and how Jesus had driven those demons out, and had gone into this herd of pigs, and the pigs had gone rushing down, Uh, the side of the mountain into the sea, and something like uh, uh, 80,000 pounds of ham were lost, was lost, as those demons uh, drove those pigs into the sea. And so good news like this gets around, the healer. Uh, And so when she heard that Jesus, the healer, was in town, she was bold beyond measure. You know, only God knows what this dear mother had been through. Um, signs of demon possession, and there are people that are today, signs of demon possession can include howling, blood-curdling screams, uh, guttural noises, eyes that glow in the dark, rapid, unnatural movements, and suicidal tendencies, such as the boy cast, uh, uh, the, the boy that Jesus cast the demon out of in Mark 922 that threw himself into the fire and into the water. Uh, demon possessed people do things where they try to harm themselves, kind of like cutting. I'm not saying that everybody that cuts is demon possessed, but it is a phenomenon that is happening, and I would expect that somebody that is demon possessed would be probably into cutting themselves. So I have some experience with, with uh, demon possession, and I'm going to quickly just try to share four of them with you. One day when we were in living, living in Spokane, the phone rang, uh, a voice on the other end said, hi, my name's Amy, and she says, you know, I, am, uh, I have been in witchcraft. I have been in witchcraft. My, my dad was a satanic high priest, and uh, I, I want to make some changes in my life, but I don't know what to do about it. Would you come and talk to me? And I said, sure. I will. She lived over close to the hospital. I made a hospital call. I went, I went by. I knocked on her door. And uh, here was this woman, attractive woman, uh, weary-looking woman, uh, a younger woman. 
And uh, she said, come in. And uh, I walked in, and she sat on the far side of the room, and I sat there on a, a chair by the door. And she just kind of studied me, and she said, aren't you afraid? I said, no. Why would I be afraid? And she said, well, I had just invited four nuns over here, and when I told them that I was demon-possessed, they left. I said, I'm not afraid. God is more powerful than that. And she was amazed by that. Amy started coming to church. Amy, when the struggles with the, with, the, with the demons went on. But when she was baptized, when I put her under the water and brought her up, she struggled no more with those evil spirits. They left. That's just one case. And uh, so, and, and about that time, sometime in the journey of, uh, of Amy there, phone rang. It was a Saturday night. Been in one of those just wild and crazy weeks. Mark understands them. And I was down there at the church office on Saturday night, still getting ready with the sermon for the next morning. And the phone rings. And I pick it up. And it is this woman, and I didn't know it at the time, but she was at a party, and they'd been high, they were high, and they were using drugs, and they had dared her to call a church. And she, she called the church. And she said to me, um, she said, you know, she says, um, I, I'm calling here to just tell you that I have two demons. I said, you do? And she said, yes, I have two demons. I know their names. I know what they look like. And I said, well, you know what? God has a remedy for that. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to know it or if you'd like to talk about it, I'd be happy to meet with you. And so she agreed. Saturday night, she agreed to meet with me out at Cheney where she lived, which is a little ways out of Spokane, a college town. She, she agreed to meet with me at Wendy's that next afternoon. Well, guess who I called to go with me? I called Amy. And my son Tyrone was, I think, a senior in high school. And uh, I, I took him with me. Maybe he was young, younger than that. I can't remember. But I took him with me, and we went out to meet at Wendy's with this demon-possessed girl. She was sitting there, and at that time, you could still smoke in restaurants. And she was sitting there smoking a cigarette when we walked in. And she, she looked like she, life was tough. She looked like she had two demons. And so we went up and talked to her, you know. And, and I remember I took my Bible, and I was going to show her a passage of Scripture and when I put my Bible out where she could see it, she became terrified. And she says, get her away from me! Get her away from me! Get her away from me! And uh, I just kind of pulled it back, you know. We kept talking. And so we kept in contact. That's when she told me that she had called me on a dare. She didn't tell me the night before. But uh, she ended up coming to church. She ended up uh, wanting to be free, but she wasn't really willing to cut the ties and and paid the price. We kept in touch. She came sometimes, and she moved to Seattle. I put her in touch with somebody there, and she went for a little while and then disappeared, and I don't know what became of her. But uh, I want to take it one more step here, folks, and that is uh, I want to tell you when I was in high school, a friend of mine had a really nice-looking cousin, and uh, she lived uh, kind of between where I, I went to high school in, in Dallas, Oregon, which is about 13 miles outside of Salem. And uh, so, uh, and she lived halfway in between. And so my, my buddy Bob, he was going to go over and see his cousin. And uh, he asked me to go with him. And, and so I thought, well, sure, why wouldn't I want to go see her? And so we went, uh, we went over there, and she had a Ouija board. I didn't know what a Ouija board was, but we played with that Ouija board. And uh, so, you know, I said to them as it started answering questions, uh, how many of you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a Ouija board? You can be honest with this, yeah. I said, you guys are just pushing that around to get the answers you want. They said, no, we're not. It, it's, it's going. It, it's, we're not, you know. And I was skeptical there for a little while. And finally, you know, uh, we just uh, started kidding it. And we said, um, a, a Ouija, what? And it stopped. It just stopped. And it, it said, we started kidding it. Ouija, why did you stop? Why, why, why did you stop? And uh, it just wouldn't move. And uh, so uh, we started laughing at it. And then... Uh, we said, uh, we, uh, Ouija, do you believe in God? And uh, there was no answer, you know. 
And finally, as we kidded it a little bit, as we had our hands on it, when we said, uh, uh, why, are, why aren't you working? And it spelled out God. God. And I'll tell you what, I said to my friends there, I said, I don't want to play with this anymore. And I just want to say, if you have a Ouija board, burn it. Burn it. If you know kids that are playing with it, it's, 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 a, it's a doorway uh, into the demon world. And so I would just say, stay away from it. Um, and uh, then, then I just one other thing, and then I'm going to move this along, but that is that we were in Lemon Grove by San Diego for, a, for a 11 years. And one night in our bedroom, I woke up, and I felt nothing but terror because there was a presence beside the bed that was just, I still, I get chills on my, up my spine when I think of it. And I knew I was in the presence of absolute evil. Absolute evil. And that thing just stayed there. And I started, I started praying. Donna was asleep beside me. She didn't know what was going on. But uh, I started praying. And Lord, uh, I'm in the presence of evil. And I don't know what to do. But there is an evil force that is beside me. I think Satan is visiting in some form, I ask you to take him away. And then by the power of Jesus' name, I ask that you remove him. And just like that, that presence was gone. But when people say they've experienced that presence, I understand. I flash back to that night, and it was terrifying. Uh, I told Donna about it the next uh, day. And so I tell you this to illustrate that only Jesus knew what this poor mother with a demon-possessed daughter had been through. And so I'm going to shift gears here again for a moment and talk about the man who was hearing impaired and pretty much unable to speak in an understandable way. He was not demon-possessed. We don't know how, uh, who his friends were or why they were so concerned about him, but this is what I want you to note. He had some people that really cared about him, cared enough about him, to take him to Jesus. And you know, that's just one of the reasons the church and prayer is so important. And it's just one reason why it would be really good for you to be with us on Tuesdays when we pray. God wants us to have people in our corner who really pray about us and really care about us. Or we need to show that kind of love to each other. Maybe you have heard along the highway of life about the Bro Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York. Those dear people in that church, they've got all types of people that seemed unredeemable that are part of that church. But part of what happened is that <clears throat> they have a 24-hour prayer ministry and they pray 24 hours a day. They have people come and they are there in the prayer room. 24 hours a day, they are praying and people are being set free. It's an amazing thing. And they've been doing it for years. It's a huge church that they have there. In Brooklyn. Now, as the story of the hearing impaired man begins, Jesus has returned back to kind of home territory. He's back in the Decapolis, and it says that in verse 32, there are some people brought to, to him a man who was deaf and could barely talk, and they begged him, they begged him to place his hand on the man. And my heart just goes out to all who have difficult hearing. Hearing is so important to communication. And, and if the person grows up with a hearing impediment, it makes their own speech difficult and unclear uh, and because they're, they're not able to say it. Uh, so most of us have met someone like this dear man along life's journey someplace, and I praise God for the friends of this man. Mark says uh, in verse 32, there are some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could barely talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man they obviously knew that Jesus had the power to restore uh, this friend's speech and, and his hearing. And how Jesus did it is very different. Uh, we'll come back to this story, but let's go to the third point. And that is both of these two needing healing were in hopeless situations. Situations normal doctors could not heal. But it wasn't a problem for Jesus. It wasn't a problem for him. The demon-possessed little girl is a truly fascinating story. Jesus, in an attempt to get some rest, slipped into a house 
of someone he obviously knew. Uh, we don't know how the mother of the daughter found out that Jesus was in town. My guess is that the disciples with, w- went with him and they went down to Starbucks for a co- cup of coffee and some local businessman or woman who had been in Jerusalem and actually seen Jesus perform a healing recognized the disciples and said, Hey, didn't I see you in Jerusalem with a man Jesus? Weren't you there when he healed that woman? And maybe like most of us, the disciples talked too much and revealed to that person that Jesus was in town. And maybe that person was related to or a relative of that little demon-possessed girl. Can't you envision them taking their coffee and hurrying to the house of that little girl and her frazzled mother and saying, Helen, Jesus is in town. Jesus is in town and he can heal your daughter. Uh, have you have you seen him perform miracles? I have. And he is resting over at Ginger's house. So just go over there with your daughter, but go and Jesus will heal her. And for the first time in her life, this worn out, despairing mother had hope that began to flicker within her heart. And quickly, she was out of the door, heading to Ginger's house to find Jesus. But there was a problem, and here it is. And that's the fourth point. The mother of the demon-possessed girl was from the wrong side of the tracks. And all of this uh, makes for the following encounter. The woman was not Jewish. She was a Canaanite of Syrian a Syrian of Greek descent, a foreigner to the Jewish people. When Jesus had sent the 12 apostles out to heal the sick and raise the dead and drive out demons, he had specifically told them, do not go among the Gentiles, non-Jews, or any town of the Samaritans, go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And Tyre is definitely then on the wrong side of the tracks. They like the Samaritans. The Jewish people... uh, They, like the Samaritans, uh, were considered or even referred to as dogs by the Jewish people. Now, I have to say that the the people that were non-Jewish looked at the Jews as dogs. And so there wasn't a great relationship there between them. But most of these folks didn't know. They didn't keep the laws of God. They were unclean. And perhaps that will help you understand a little bit Jesus' response when the mother of the demon-possessed daughter showed up unannounced, begging Jesus to heal her daughter. Notice the conversation here in Mark 7, 25 through 28. The woman was a Greek born in Syria, Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. But notice Jesus' very unusual response. Uh, He said, first, let the children. He's talking about the people of Israel. He said, let the children eat all they want, for it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Matthew, in his gospel, gives us some extra insight. He records Jesus as saying, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And on the surface, that seems kind of like a surprising maybe even unloving response when he said, it's not right to take the children's food and cast it to the dogs. It it looks uh, like an unloving response on the part of Jesus. I mean, look at the woman. I don't think she looked like a Hollywood movie star. I think she's exhausted. I think she's worn. I think her clothes are wrinkled and her hair is in desperate need of some help and her eyes, it's her eyes that tell the story. There's the fear, there's the helplessness, there's the despair. Look at her eyes and they are pleading and they are begging and they are hoping for a miracle and they are also stubbornly non-negotiable. Her daughter has to be healed. And so it seems strange that Jesus would say first, let the children eat all they want, for it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. But the mother knew that the Jews referred to all Gentiles as dogs, so she didn't take offense. Her mission was far too important for her to react negatively. And I just look at that response And I say, beautiful. Beautiful was her response. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs 
that fall from the master's table. Max Lucado got my attention when he described this situation in one of his books. He said something like, look at Jesus as he surveys this frantic, exhausted mother. See the tenderness in his eyes. See the slight smile of kindness on his lips as he says softly to her, testing her faith. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. But her response is priceless. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Just a crumb of your healing, master, is what she's saying. I want you to to notice that Matthew's account uh, of what happens next. Matthew puts it this way in Matthew 15, 28. Jesus' response was, woman, you have great faith. You have great faith. Mark records Jesus as saying, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter, and she went home and found her lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Only twice in the scriptures does does, uh, Jesus say somebody had great faith. He didn't say it to the apostles. He didn't say it to the people of Israel. No, he said it to the precious mother of this newly restored, formerly demon-possessed daughter, And he said it in Matthew 8.10 of a Roman centurion who came seeking healing for his suffering paralyzed servant. And he said to those two non-Jews, he said, great faith, great faith. Man, I want to have great faith. How about you? Great faith. And a little girl was set free from a demon. The other miracle at the end of Mark 7, the man with the hearing and speech impediment is most unusual. In response to the urgent request of the man's friend, Jesus took him aside and did an object lesson on him. Did you catch that as we read it? His hearing didn't work and his tongue didn't work. And so Jesus, first of all, put his finger in the man's ears. And then he pulled one finger out, spit on it, and touched his tongue. And your first response might be, ooh. But it was probably the sweetest taste the man ever had because suddenly the tongue was set free. And so uh, what an experience. And Mark says, Jesus looked up to heaven before he did this and with a deep sigh he said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, And he began to speak plainly. But as I wrap this up, I want to ask you this question. Please notice, why did Jesus look up to heaven before he healed the man and he gave a deep sigh? Could it be? Could it be because of the power of the tongue to do great good or to do great evil? Could it be? because of the power of the tongue to speak healing words or hateful words? Could it be because of the power of the tongue to blaspheme or to bless? How would this man use his newfound power of speech? I think that's why Jesus sighed. May our tongue speak words of faith and healing, not words of cursing or words of distortion or words of rumor. May God bless us all in our speech. And that just it leads me to the closing point, And that is both healings were driven by the undying, determined faith of others. There's power in faith. There's power in prayer. And I conclude with these two verses, one on faith and one on prayer. Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20 and 21, I tell you the truth. If you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. And then one on prayer. It says in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, this is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have what we ask of him. May God bless this message and his word to your hearts today.